The next um, presentation is uh, the Professor Joop Langer and Ms. Jacqueline van Tonren Memorial Lecture. Joop was a pioneering Dutch HIV clinical researcher, a founding co-director of HIFNET. His life was dedicated to improving access of HIV therapy and healthcare in developing countries. He was the founder of Farm Access and the Amsterdam Institution for Global Health and Development. Jacqueline was the director of communications at um, the same institute and was key in turning Newb's plan into reality. We have um, Mr. Gitten Kwarap. Uh, Pam giving this talk. Gitten is currently the manager of a community and policy at MFAS Treat Asia program in Bangkok, Thailand. He has been working on improving HIV and hepatitis C treatment access, advocating for price reductions, scaling up national responses, and improving regulatory uptake of direct acting antiretrovirals in South and Southeast Asia. The title of his talk is Treatment for All Means Getting Treatment to All. Where are we now in the Asia Pacific? Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Swadika, um, and a very good morning to all of you. Um, it's indeed an absolute honor and a privilege to be giving this uh, talk in the memory of Professor Hugh Lands and Miss Jacqueline Van Togeren, who have contributed immensely so much in the fight against HIV. Um, I never really had the opportunity to work very closely with either Professor Lands or with Miss Jacqueline. But what I have been shared, what I have been informed about the contributions and their work and the legacy that they have left for all of us to live up to, it, it, gives, it gives me nothing but more respect to the people that have departed and not among us now. Many of us know Professor Lanz and Miss Jacqueline as a physician, as a scientist, or as a nurse. But to many, they were activists who were trying to make an impact and touching many lives in ensuring treatment. They stood against disparity and they were fighting against security. And as a visionary, much before his passing away, Professor Lanz had believed that nothing is impossible, especially when it's inevitable. And from a treatment perspective, we can interpret this in a way to say that it is not impossible to, to, to make treatment reach all and it's inevitable that the medicines that we have now reaches everybody who needs it. That brings me to my topic today, which is about treatment for all means, getting treatment to all. And I'll give you a status update and a brief of where we are in Asia Pacific as of now. In the next 30 minutes, I will take you through some of the struggle, and it's really important for us to be remembering that history it did not just start as where we are. There was a past. There was a history to where we are today. The struggle around how we started the, the treatment access movement. The role of the community and civil society groups in the region and around the world that, that, have, given, that have played an important role in ensuring treatment and to bring us to where we are today. The processes around drug development and, and, and the development of treatment policies to bring where we are. And at the end, I will give you some of my own personal reflections to, 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 to summarize where we are today and what should we do next. We would recall in the past, back around 40 years ago in the United States, five people reported to have pneumocystis carinine pneumonia. And four or five years down the line, 12,000 people had died in the United States. The virus was spreading. It was not confined to the earlier group of people where the virus was found, but it had started touching hemophiliacs, it had started touching people who inject drugs, and it was also found among, more among gay men. At that time, there was no medication. There was, there was, there was stigma. And there was kind of hopelessness, and there was something which we used to say earlier about that sentence. There was despair and there was nothing that people would, 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 uh, would be really looking forward to with a hope. Even in Asia, we were seeing, we started seeing our cases. 
In Thailand, we saw our first case of HIV in 1984. 1986, Malaysia and India, where many of our colleagues are from in this room. 87 in Indonesia. Myanmar, 88. Vietnam, 90. So we were not very far behind. We started responding. We were seeing our own cases, even in our region, in, it, in, in, in here. And many of you here actually were present when these cases were diagnosed, and we started responding to this new infection. And then in 1987, Zidbudin, as many of us know, was approved by the US FDA for the first time to treat HIV. But it was very costly. We perhaps would not, cannot imagine now, but it costed around 10,000 US dollars per person per year. And more importantly, it was, a, it was available to only a very few people in the United States or to very few in high-income countries. So this was something out of reach, even though the medication was there. And then an HIV community started emerging. And this was not the case that we have now where we have, we have uh, you know, PLHIV networks and groups across the nations uh, or, or uh, globally or uh, even in small districts and, 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 and um, uh, you know, localities that we have. But there was a community, there was a group of people who were demanding more political action to be taken, more policies to be taken, asking the federal drug authorities to take more action, access to those experimental drugs that we had in those days. So it was something that was very new. There was a group of people who were asking about research, research that it was something not like what Professor Kelleher was just talking about now, but more merely asking for understanding what is this new infection. Perhaps those group of this community groups did not imagine that we would have something like what Professor Callagher was talking about just you know, a few minutes ago. But they demanded action. They demanded that actions needs to be taken, and we have to know this emerging infection better. Even in Asia, we were not very far behind. Many of us are here from Malaysia. In 1986, if we recall, there were rationing of drugs. People would get either monotherapy, and this was up to a certain period of years. People would get monotherapy. There were a group of people who used to get triple combination of antiretroviral free from the government. And there were a group of people who would buy two drugs out of pocket and would can get one drug from the government. So there was rationing of this drug because the drugs were extremely expensive in those days. And then in 2002, there was a group of, group of people who sat down with the government and said that there are things that we can do in exercising our own laws and that has been allowed by international laws to be able to provide access to these medications. And in 2003, Malaysia became the first country in the world to issue a compulsory license against antiretrovirals. And that had resulted in an increased number of patients to be treated in Malaysia and the prices of the patented drugs in those days dropped by 57%. Uh, 57%. In Thailand, again, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's for us to remember this history, and many of us are here from Thailand. So where we are now, there was a past to this. In 1999, the drugs were extremely expensive, and people who could get access to those medicines were, were, were either participating in some kind of a research or they were paying out of pocket. And those were not the kind of best drugs that we find now. And in 1999, there was a World Bank report which said that Thailand, to, to treat only 100,000 people in Thailand, we would need around half, approximately half of that time, total health budget, or 2,000% of that aid spending in those, in those days, in 1999. And that was something which the Thai government would not be able to do. In 2001, two PLHIV challenged the patent on Didanosin, which a drug which is not no longer used in most of the cases. But there was a challenge to patent on Didanosin in 2001. 2001 in that same year is the year when we started a universal health coverage. And in 2003, that case by the two people, two, two person living with HIV, they actually won that case. The innovator also gave up the pursuing further of this patent. And this was the first instance in the history of Thailand where the Thai judiciary allowed patients 
to challenge patent. And we believe this was the first instance anywhere in the world where a judiciary allowed patients and say that patients are actually interested parties, not the companies, not the governments only, but patients can actually, they're interested party and they can challenge the patents. So this was the first time when the Thai judiciary actually allowed patients to, 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 uh, to challenge patents. And this has hold a very, uh, uh, a very important, uh, you know, uh, this was regarded as a very important uh, uh, ruling from, from the judiciary globally at that time. And it continues to hold that importance till now. In 2003, the triple combination of antiretroviral was included uh, 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 in the National Essential Medicines list. So it's not been very long that triple combinations have actually been included in our National Essential Medicine list. Uh, in between 2004 and 2005, our Department of Disease Control had a different set of negotiations through different channels for prices to be dropped, of prices of patented drugs to be dropped. And as a follow-up of that, in 2005, there was a committee that was formed to negotiate price reduction of the antiretroviral drugs. In 2006 and 2007, late 2006 and early 2007, Thailand issued a compulsory license on efavirenz and lopinavir and ritonavir. And in 2007, they started importing efavirenz from India. Price dropped suddenly to 650 from 1400 a bottle for efavirenz. And the price of Caletra dropped from 2,000 US dollars to 1,000 US dollars per person per year. And this has resulted in five years from 2010 to 2014, Thailand saving around 339 million US dollars on, only on drug cost. So this was a remarkable drop in terms of you know, price reductions uh, that, that, that uh, and, and the government had been able to to perceive the way forward towards. And these actions did not have only impact, as I said, in Thailand, but also had global impacts. And this was a result, and the case of Malaysia was a result of knowledge, the evidence that we generated from science and research, the civil movement and public, uh, public support that was generated throughout that civil society movement, and the leadership of those days, and the policy makers of those days. These three came together and allowed this price reductions and access to a treatment to improve in these two countries. I'm just sharing two examples here. India is another, which we always talk about. We know nowadays as India to be the pharmacy of the developing world. Um, and, but India was not like this. India also had its own share of issues. In 1947, India got independence from, from, the, uh, from the British rule. And between 1947 to 1972, India retained the British patent law. So they had a 14 years patent on the medications. They had to rely on drugs that are imported from outside. And they also had one of the highest prices of medicine in the world. And then in 1972, they reformed their patent law. They changed the patent law. And they abolished what the British had, which was a patent on the products, but they allowed patent on the process of making that product and not the product. So that's what India followed for a quite a period of time. And in 2001, as we heard, and I'll share more about that as the slides come on, we got the first fixed dose combination pill from the Indian generics. By 2003, 39% of, from having the highest medication cost in the world, one of the highest, by 2003, 39% of the overall global ARV market was with the Indian generics, while the innovators had around 61%. And this had changed in 2008 to 87% with the Indian generics and 5% of the innovator. There is something which is called as non-Indian generic and that hold that in between three or 4%. So you can sh see that vast improvement when a patent law was changed. Going back a little bit again, in 1995, India joined the World Trade organization. So 1st of January 1995, this was when the World Trade Organization was established and many of our countries here in this room actually joined. 
So India got 10 years, 10 years to comply to the World Trade Organization's rules. So in 2005, they became uh, compliant to the, the requirements of, of, of the World Trade Organization, and it demanded a new patent law in compliance with the World Trade Organization rules to be formed. So in 2005, they had to comply and they had to change their new laws. Now, at, the same, at, that, at that same time, PLHIV groups started marching in 10 big Indian cities protesting against those patent reforms because they wanted to maintain that supply of medication. It was not only the enterotrovirus for HIV, but there were many other medications where people were relying on to get life-saving treatment from India. And in 2006, PLHIV groups filed their first patent opposition in India. In between 2006 and 2013, the Indian PLHIV groups, outside of the remit of the HIV medications that they were fighting for access to, fought to defend their country's patent law. And this is very famously known as the Novartis case in India, where people, uh, PLHIV groups, fought to defend a section within the patent law to, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to maintain uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the production capacity or the way that India was supplying those drugs. From that time onwards, up until 2000, uh, up till now, uh, in, in the Indian civil society groups has been in the forefront fighting for access to treatment, be it on phasing out of, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, drugs which are no longer used, ensuring there are no stockouts, uh, op opposing free trade agreements, and you know, challenging uh, trade laws that are not required by the World Trade Organization regulations, or upholding the flexibilities that are within the Indian patent law. So all these changes were happening, and you know, WHO, as one of the custodians, and many of our countries, most of our countries here as low and middle income countries, follow the WHO normative guidance to allow patients to be on treatment or to monitor, or monitor the treatment. So WHO also were changing its policy. So from 2002 onwards, when we started with a CD4 threshold of more, less than 200 to be initiated on treatment, we were slowly evolving to say by 2015, forget the CD4, treat everybody who is infected. And once a person is diagnosed, treat, every, treat, treat that person with the antiretroviral medications. So that had changed from 2015 onwards, and countries have started adopting even in our region. But in our region, where are we? So if we look at the global coverage of treatment, it's around 62%. And uh, the Africa region is around 64%. But we have two, two reasons here, which is known as the, either the Southeast Asia uh, region or the Western Pacific region. So we are lagging behind. We are not up to either the global trend or to the extent where Africans have, our African colleagues have reached. So we are at 53% at the zero region and 59% at the Wipro region. Uh, some of the countries are doing very well. Countries like Cambodia, countries like Myanmar, Thailand are doing very well um, in terms of providing treatment, but there are uh, there are countries which definitely needs to pick up and to be able to provide treatment to those people and to that, to that policy of treat all. But we do have that opportunity now, and we have always heard about Dolotegravir. I'm just using these photos as an indicative picture and not to promote any product, but there are opportunities and there are products that are already available, and we know that Dolotegravir or Dolotegravir containing regimens has been recommended as the first line, uh, preferred first line by the World Health Organization for, uh, for quite a number of years now. Now, where are this Dolotegravir in the global context? Uh, tenofovir, lemibudin, and dolotegravir, and dolotegravir 50 milligram now have been procured or is under procurement by the Global Fund under their, global, uh, under their pool procurement program. So countries have started procuring these medications. Multiple African countries have started already using this as a preferred first-line regimen. Some of our countries, I'll come de in, in later as an example, but most of the country in Africa are leading this and they've started using uh, dolotegravir containing regimen as a preferred first line. And you would now note, uh, in case if, if people are not aware, uh, Global uh, uh, Fund and PEFAR both uh, have asked countries to stop 
procuring nevirapine using their funds. So you would not find countries procuring, except for disposable tablets and oral solution, you will not find countries procuring nevirapine anymore. And that has been shifted to procurement of dolutegravir or dolutegravir-containing regimens. So that's the global shift from, the, from uh, the biggest donors that is supporting HIV programs or procurement of antiretroviral drugs in our countries. To allow this to happen for countries to purchase this medication, you definitely need quality assessment to be done. And this is one of the, uh, the, the, the points that, that is always asked either by our national programs or by our FDAs to see where we are in terms of quality and are we exposing our, our patients to drugs that are not certified or not had been assessed. So you would see that a multiple number of, 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 country, uh, of, of products either have a US FDA tentative approval or they already have WHO pre-qualification, which allows either to be procured by PFAR funding or by the, the, through uh, using the global fund uh, 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 mechanisms. So we have these options, we have these products where our countries and our programs could rely on to, to, to get. Um, in terms of where we are uh, the, in, 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 in the procurement, Dolotegravir uh, is now approved in 36 countries globally. Six are in Asia Pacific. Um, and uh, TLD, the fixed dose combination of tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir, uh, is approved in 35 countries, and four countries are in Asia Pacific. Uh, the latest country that have approved these combinations are Thailand, and, and it has taken a little bit of time, but it's absolute, uh, absolutely necessary that we have this medication uh, as, as approved uh, in our setting. It's, it's, it's a good news, and I'm sure all of you would agree to this. Uh, a few examples of where we are um, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of the national guidelines to use dolotegravir. So uh, countries like Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, uh, India, we all have started recommendation in our national guidelines to use dolotegravir containing regimens. And uh, we have set, uh, we have our, our own set of criteria um, uh, 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 to, to, to put our patients or, or to switch our patients from uh, um, an earlier regimen to the adolotegravir containing regimen. So these are all progresses, uh, but absolutely you would agree that we need to do better and more countries need to step up and go with the global trend to be able to, to, uh, uh, to provide the much uh, needed treatment. Now, if we remember that history again, how far we have come. Um, from that $10,000 per person per year, uh, you remember Cipla, the Indian generic company, uh, announcing that they can sell the fixed dose combination back in 2001, uh, less than one dollar a year. Uh, I mean, less than three uh, uh, fifty dollars. Uh, I mean, less than a dollar a day. So it w it worked out around three fifty U.S. dollars a day. And we dropped ten years down the line. We had dropped to almost eighty dollars per person per year with newer drugs, with newer regimens that were recommended. There was a slight. Um, uh, increase in antiretroviral drugs with drugs coming in like entricitabine and tenofovir. Uh, but then now, uh, uh, at, at 2009, uh, 2009, almost 20 years down the line, we have completed one whole circle in terms of drug pricing, and we can get the, the dolotegravir containing regimen at 66, which is the tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolotegravir at approximately $60 per person per year. So this is where that price is coming from from uh, with the Global Fund uh, Pool Procurement. And you can get TLE, which is mainly, uh, a lot of our researchers actually take part, took part in the 400 milligram efavirenz related studies. And uh, you can get that uh, at $66 per person per year. Uh, TLD at the similar price, only dolotegravir standalone at $42 per person per year. Tenofovir and lamivudine combination at $40 per person per year and uh, the tenofovir and emtricitabine at approximately $54 per person per year. So this, this drop, even in the case of TLE 400, has been because of the price drop in, with, with the uh, entry of dolutegravir. So there has been a remarkable price in the last 20 years price reduction, and that history that I talk about has allowed this to happen. But then, when it comes to pediatric, it is not the same. Um, the, as children get older, you would note that you know they, the the price of these drugs gets 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 because children would have to uh, increase their dosing, so they would need 
the, 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 the older the child is, the higher the cost. And at this point, the granules or uh, the pellets that we talk about, which is more uh, child-friendly, um, is approximately 783 um, per person, uh, per child per year. And this was a disparity which Professor Land mentioned in his talk here in 2013, the last time he attended the symposium. This disparity on pediatric formulations needs to be filled. I don't know how and when we would be able to do it. Maybe in the next three or four or five years we'll be able to see that happen. But this is a disparity which Professor Land stood against and mentioned in his 2013 talk. This disparity as, as, as we mentioned, as I mentioned, is, 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 uh, is a challenge for us. And again, if we come specific to dolotegravir um, uh, 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 for the pediatric formulations, 10 milligram and 25 milligram formulations are currently not available in generic formulations. And um, it, it's, it, it's an issue on access for children weighing less than 30 kilogram. Uh, the Bacavir, Lembibidin, and Dolochegravir fixed dose combination at the moment, as far as I'm aware, is manufactured only by one generic uh, company outside of the Innovata. So that also is, is a challenge. Um, the Lopinavir, Ritonavir pellets and granules are only manufactured by two companies, um, and uh, this is severely limiting uh, the, the, the supply ability against the, uh, the, the actual need, and this has actually already resulted in, in, um, in stockouts in Africa. Um, so we, we need to address this gap in terms of pediatric formulations, both in terms of supply and both in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of pricing, supplies, and also in terms of formulations. The future. Where we are, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about drugs uh, that, that uh, would be coming up in the next uh, uh, talks, uh, but these are medications that we can get in months, in a year, uh, and the, the, we don't have to wait long. This, I'm, I'm not talking about long-acting you know, antivirals here. We already have TAF, um, m in generic formulations as co-formulation. We have TAF, uh, tenofovir alafenamide with m in and dolo Dolotegravir as fixed dose combinations. Um, uh, and we also have uh, tenofibrilafenamide uh, with emtricitabine and bictegravir in generic uh, formulation. So these are drugs that our government, our uh, uh, you know, FDAs could prioritize and could assist in terms of enabling patients to be on these drugs uh, to, to the ones who, are, uh, uh, who, who needs these uh, medications. Um, now, some of my uh, personal reflections uh, to, towards summarizing this talk. Uh, the efforts of our scientists, of our researchers, our physicians, the community, the civil society, people living with HIV, we all have come a long way. And we have worked in different focus areas. But then those efforts, those contributions that every single one of us has made has allowed us to come to a stage as to where we are today. The treatment policies uh, have progressed, and so has the availability of antiretroviral. We're not talking about these, those days of monotherapy. We're not talking about those days when we had to pay $10,000 per person per year. But uh, we are talking about a time when, when, uh, when the policies have progressed so much. We're saying that treat everybody who has the infection at any stage, and that treatment are as low as 66 US dollars per person per year. The developing countries are getting the drugs, and we're not looking at cheapest drugs. Of course, we're getting the cheapest drugs at this point, but we're not looking at cheapest as in the past. Um, uh, uh, Dolotegravir as fixed dose combination, perhaps, we as developing countries and in Africa are getting prior to the developed countries. Our countries and our programs are using it prior to developed countries. So we have come one full circle in terms of access to treatment here. But then again, disparities in terms of pediatric, I would like to reiterate again that this has to be filled somehow. I would hope to hear some of the research in the next two days around pediatric formulations and how we are addressing some of the gaps in terms of reaching out to those children. Again, um, the, the Asia Pacific more, again, we are lagging behind. We are much behind the global trends and we need to improve this. We have to catch up. Overall, it's around, compared to that 62%, I think Asia Pacific, as per the UNH data, we have a treatment coverage of around 53%. So we are far below the Africa region or below that global trend. 
The cost of the newer antiretroviral drugs are dropping, um, uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, our, our governments and our national programs are yet to fully capitalize on this opportunity. Uh, we have to definitely focus on the lutegravir containing regimen for as many patients as we could in our region and for all those who could tolerate this and who can be on this and who are willing to be on this, on, on this medication. Uh, civil society and communities, um, uh, they have played that civil uh, movement, have played an important role in terms of ensuring treatment and defending their own sovereign laws, be it in Thailand, be it in India, be it in Malaysia, be it in Myanmar, or in any other country that we are. And we have to appreciate the fact that we have a si very strong civil society movement in our region. Coming back, Professor Land had believed that nothing is impossible. And that is especially when it is inevitable. And in, as I said in the beginning of my talk, it is not impossible that treatment reaches everybody. And it's inevitable that these medications that we have now reaches everybody who needs this medication. If we can get a cold Coca-Cola or a beer in every remote corner of Africa, it should not be impossible to do the same thing with drugs. And I'm sure this is true in the case of Asia also. And Professor Lanz, if he was here and talking about Dulotegravir at $66 per person per year, he would step out of that Africa and say that we can do this globally and it is not impossible to treat everybody and it is inevitable now that we treat everybody with the best of the medications. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>